Welcome to the Barbarian Hour podcast, where we conquer the impossible. The Barbarian Hour podcast is presented by Barbarian Apparel. Here is Jared Opfer and Zeb Miller. Are you ready? In this show, we talk with Johnny DeJulius. Johnny was a three-time state champion and wrestled for the Ohio State Buckeyes National Championship team. He shares his unique perspective on life, his message to the wrestling community, and shares his most memorable adventures. Be sure to check Johnny out on social media for his upcoming camp dates. Be sure to visit barbarianapparel.com slash BA hour for Barbarian Hour singlet specials. Visit our friend Teague Moore, the wrestling consultant on Facebook or the wrestling consultant.com. Use code BA hour for a free 15 minutes. Hi, so welcome to the Barbarian Hour, man. We're uh, we're glad to have you on. We're we're excited. You know, uh, I'm, I'm stoked. Let's do it. Coming to Ohio, right, for uh, a camp coming up at the yeah June. Summer. What was it? June eighth, June ninth, one of those. Uh, well, you're coming to Sandusky, right? June yeah, June tenth. But are, oh, you're talking about Barbarian uh, with, yes, with Dylan yes. in uh in May. Yeah, that'll be good. May twenty second, twenty third, I think too. Right? Yep. Okay. Yep. So listeners, the. Li- was jumping in that don't know, right? Johnny, right? Zeb, we've known Johnny for a while, right? Zeb just gave me a little fact. Dude, I'm sure I already know what he told you. I already know what he told you. He well, told you he that he spilled his coffee. <laughs> he didn't tell me his coffee <laughs> with a freaking football when I was eight years old. I already know what he told you. And he made me do sprints after practice in front of everybody and everybody counted them. Oh, yeah, ouch. I was that guy. I'm that guy. That, that Were you there? Story. Did I make you do the bear crawls in the uh, orchard? Maybe. I don't remember. I know one of the workouts you made us do one time, you and Bernie made us carry uh, like 10-pound dumbbells on a three-mile run, which doesn't sound that bad. It's so annoying after you do it for like, you know, a half a mile. You're like, geez. And Mark Gray wouldn't trade with me. We were supposed to alternate, and he just ran it on his own. He just took off. That was the one that uh, Kits has slept through it. I think Kitsis and like Dave Habit slept through it. Man, and I was Simon Kitsis, holy cow! That yeah, was and crazy. then I made that. He's actually from Boston, I think. Yeah, he's from Mass. Yeah, so I made those guys. I think Dave told it out when he was on. I talked to Dave, pet him on a couple times, and um, yeah, he was like, "Yeah, you, you made me. My hands were bleeding, and I was like, yeah, Eric, <laughs> Eric, made, Eric made me do it, so I had to do it.'" Right. And, um, that was the first camp you ever came to when you knocked my coffee over. That was the first one. Were you eight? I was young, dude. I was definitely nine, eight or nine years old. I think. Yeah, you were. Yeah. yeah, you weren't in junior high yet. I know that. No, no, definitely not. But fourth, fourth grade, probably wow. so ten, maybe at the latest. Jeez. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. No, he did tell me Please that. Go story, way but... back, and you that's the last that. time I actually shaved back then. So. <laughs> How much did you weigh in eighth or in, in, as a fourth grader? You were because you were always little. Fourth grade, probably like 55, 60. Oh yeah, I was little. Ferdinand's five and he weighs 50 pounds. <laughs> I was little because I remember when I was uh when I was in seventh grade, I was thinking about wrestling like 72 at Tulsa. So I was little, like even in junior high. I, I told Jared about the, uh, about the coffee, right? I brought the coffee up. You, you nailed it. But my first state final I ever called for Martin Floriani and Flo Wrestling was Ty. Was you and Ty? Oh yeah, state. I remember the call. What is it like wrestling your best friend in the state final? Talk about that. First, as a first of all, first of all, when I talk about high school at all, like to these Harvard kids or like. I see a lot of kids on clinics, right? So if we get to talk and then we go past the college, like, you know, stories, we get to high school. I'm not, I don't think I'm that old, but I have to explain to them that I wrestled in different weight classes than they have now. And anytime I say that, they look at me like I'm ancient. Like, dude, 103 does not feel that long ago. <laughs> like, it's crazy. That's a good point. But yeah, I was 103. So um, I always have to say, oh, back when they had 103, which makes uh, me sound old, old you know? But um, yeah, it was tough. You know, me and me and Ty wrestling, we uh, we definitely like didn't hang out as much like that season. You know, like we used to. But um, yeah, it was tough, especially wrestling 
sectional district and state finals. Bang, bang, bang. Like all three in a row. That was crazy. That's that's a good point on the 103. It's you know, growing up here in those different weight classes. Man, look at they had different weight classes or heavy was yeah, limited, yeah. right? And they they're old. So uh so when you do these camps, right? Because you do quite a bit of camps, what uh any match they bring up that they they see on YouTube or flow or anything. So you know what? I'll tell you some stuff that I like and I dislike that, that <laughs> bothers me. So I always thought my like insecurity wise for myself, I always thought my uh my accolades never equaled like how good I was skill wise, right? Like I can't call myself an all-American, but I can say things like I beat a Hodge trophy winner, right? Like two years ago at the US Open, I beat Jason Ness, or like I beat Joe Cologne, who was third in the world, or, or you know, multiple NCAA champs. So they'll ask me uh for my resume. They'll be like, Oh, can you send over something so we can make a flyer? I just asked you that, right? Right. So <laughs> I'll say, Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. And I'll send it. And then you you know this, but a lot of people don't. Yeah, because I have I have a decent name thanks to Ohio State, you know. And, and I beat good guys in college. People always reply, okay, how many times did you all American? And I get so, I'm like, well, you see. <laughs> so I hate that part. But uh, something they bring up a lot. A lot of people bring up the Brewer match because uh, Vegas every year they, they, they post that. Uh, they bring up the Brewer one a lot. And I had a decent little rivalry with Corey Clark. So a lot of people talk about that. So that, that, that's, I like telling people I beat him because, you know, I didn't really like him very much. <laughs> <laughs> he's an Iowa guy and those guys are clowns <laughs> that's awesome no that's cool because I'm sure you get that you know it's funny you hear these camps and they're like they bring up some weird ass match right it's like well, oh yeah are you bringing up crazy. so what some of the people like what social media has done like for these camps like uh, it's it's kept me in the camp scene like relevant when I have no business being relevant like anymore it's awesome you know what I mean So so I always think like if I wanted to sell a room out the way like Kyle Dake could or somebody with a huge name, not going to happen. But what my best, my best uh, trait that I have going for me is people like word of mouth will share videos of how I teach. And that's where I'm really confident. I know I can talk better than a lot of these robot wrestlers, right? I, not that kid takes a robot. He was just an example, but like, I know I can talk a lot better than these robots and and social media has like made the camp things explode. You know, like this summer, I got between June and July only 22 camps right now in 12 different states. So it's awesome. That's awesome. Good for you, man. A little tour. That is. That is. Zeb, Zeb's came to see me at ISI. He's filmed me telling these stories. It's been awesome. Yeah, running with the Bulls. You and running with the Bulls and, and Bryce. Yeah, you and Bryce ran with the Bulls. I think I posted all that stuff on YouTube as well. I know I a put it on flow. A lot of people have clicked that, ironically. A lot of people have brought that up to me. Oh, I heard the story when I was sitting on the table. Remember when I was sitting on the table? Yeah. And yeah. a lot of people, it wasn't the bull story. It was something else I said. I think it was about, like, right when I went, maybe I came to Harvard or something like that. Um, they talk about the interview all the time. And that it's just one I hear all the time about. Yeah, we do. Because you and I sat, we, we did a long interview and then I did all your technique and did your stories. I think all of it's on YouTube. I know it is. Yeah. And then, cause I put it on flow cause I was still working with them. And then uh, I just try and put the place, put it as many places as I can. And then the dual meet was really cool at ISI. That was cool. Yeah. ISI does a good job of that stuff. Yeah. Steve. Good job. Steve does yeah. a good job. I, just, I have a camp for him in two, in a week. He in is one, week. one of Josh, him and Josh Sassby are here. Yeah, they're boys. They are like best. Yeah. Steve Farrell and Josh Sasby are besties. They go to How NCAAs about- together. They do ISI and all the gear together. Those dudes are like two peas in a pod. How about this? How about Dylan Palacio goes to ISI with me and he gets like a lot of hate, like for social media stuff. You know how he is. He's crazy, right? And what he doesn't show a lot, like he's kind of like the heel sometimes, like the one who's against the grain. So I'm out there doing a clinic uh, two weeks ago at Steve's. And I said, have you talked to Dylan in a while? And he goes, oh, I was actually about to close my doors down because of COVID. I wasn't doing any practices for club. So I was going to just, you know, not have the club anymore. And Dylan PayPal'd me a few thousand bucks to keep my doors open. 
that you know what I mean like Dylan would never show that kind of stuff and I thought that was really cool that he did that with Steve I thought that was really cool he also pays for a group of kids I think the Cleveland Beach Beach kids was the team that he paid for last time Dylan Palacio pays for a team and he makes he's made a scholarship fund and he keeps increasing it and obviously he's he knows something about the crypto that we don't or I, That's I know what I say. Don't. He, he he says that people like will donate and it's obviously eligible to be donated to but a lot of the money that he he has for the for the scholarship fund is his own he'll put it in so kids can go to that camp you know like he'll do a clinic and then like donate so a kid can go to camp it's pretty cool that, that's that's pretty cool man <clears throat> it's uh so so what to- so what's going on at Harvard, man? Right, man, Ivy League. It's yeah. tough working with them. You know they don't want anybody right. to train right now. That's why Max and Gabe Dean are leaving Cornell. Uh, you know it's like all up in the air. We don't know what's going on. Fortunately, right now the rules in Boston is basically going to be back to regular in like August or something like that. So that'll be good. Um, and then we're allowed to go into our uh, on campus finally. Um, come uh, come September, September first. So, so how'd you end up there, though, at Harvard? What was the story behind? I was that? actually at ISI, ironically. I uh, got a call. So, so it's funny. Um, you ever heard of the word pro noia? Pro noia. No, I'm not so sure. it sounds like paranoia, right? Par- paranoia is everyone's out to get me. I'm, you know, opposite. Everything is a net. It's the opposite. It's the opposite of pro noia everything good or bad that happens, the universe is like conspiring in your favor kind of thing. Right. So I always believed in not that, like, I didn't know what that word was, but like different, like examples of that, like a lot of things have to go wrong for something to go perfect kind of thing. Like, you know, whatever it is. And, uh, I call it, right. I call it my pothole theory. I don't know if I made this up, but I heard it long time ago. I think I made it up. We're just going to go with, I made it up. Uh, Imagine like you're going somewhere you're super excited to go to, right? Like a, like a concert or, or a flight you're about to catch for vacation one time a year. Or maybe you're going to watch like a wrestling dual meet and boom, you hit a pothole and your tire's flat. And now you're going to have to spend the next 20, for me, 30, you know, because it takes me a while, 30 minutes changing your tire. You know, you might make it to the dual meet on time, but you're going to miss 25 and 33, the two matches you wanted to see. Maybe the concert, you know, maybe that little segment's over or you're going to miss your whatever you're really looking forward to. That pothole really like effed it up. You know what I mean? Right. So you throw the the spare on, you start driving, you know, 20, 30 minutes later and um, and you see a fatal, maybe maybe fatal car accident, like a mile or two down the road. And now in your head, you're like, oh, that sucks. And you keep driving. Right. And you're complaining about your day. Can't believe this happened. It's the worst thing that could have happened to me. Little do you know that pothole saved your life, right? So I think about that stuff all the time. What kind of potholes, you know, saved my life that I could complain about really easily, but maybe pro noia wise, like set me up. You know what I mean? So one of those actually is the fact that I never all American. I always think about this. If I all American, would I feel like I had enough of wrestling? Okay. You know what? I have something, you know, uh, evidence that I was good, you know, for myself. Maybe I would have worked with my dad. Maybe I would have, you know, be speaking with him, whatever. He, he wants me to work with him all the time. He asked me like every other week. Um, he doesn't want me jumping off stuff anymore. I can see why. I believe uh, so, so a little part of me was still hungry to compete. Uh, I think a lot of that was because of the, you know, not all American pothole that I hit. Right. And I decided, you know, what? I want to coach for Jimmy A, Jimmy Andresi. <laughs> Shout out. Zeb knows him. And then, uh, and then that led to, you know, continuing to wrestle us open stuff, which led down a string of events to, you know, being, uh, there it is being, uh, being, you know, looked at it by Jimmy Shep talk at Harvard. I actually got hired at Maryland. How about this for another pothole? I never graduated Ohio state at the time. It was like two or three years after my senior year and I had two credits left one class. I got hired by Carrie at Maryland. And they said, we can't go through with it because you still have two credits left. Oh, so yeah. I had to go back to Ohio State. That same year, Shep Talk left Maryland and coached at Harvard, gave me a call the following year. Hey, did you finish? Boom. 
locked it in, was able to come to Harvest. That was pretty cool. Wow, that is a good story. That's pretty cool. Wow, I, I, is, I forgot yeah. about the Maryland. I forgot about that. Why did it take you so long to get your degree? And, and why did you ultimately, I mean, what, what made you ultimately want to do it? You didn't know that this Harvard job was going to be there. You knew I that did, you yeah, get the true. Maryland job. What, what made you get a degree? So um, it was, it was, it was a lot of laziness, Zeb. Uh, <laughs> it was a lot I like of your honesty. It was a lot of, uh, I want to go travel the world right now instead of taking online classes. Uh, so what happened was my fifth year, I wasn't the greatest student, right? But like, I definitely should have been done by my fifth year, my senior year at college, but I had two classes left or two credits left or, or whatever it was, I forget, where I would have had to go into the summer, right? I didn't want to go into the summer. I want to do some clinics and stuff like that. So I said to myself, you know what? I'll just finish those two credits online uh, in the fall, right? One thing leads to another. Life happens. Jim and Tracy calls me at Kent State. Do you want to coach here? I start coaching. Um, I'm running a club with Ty. And, you know, that, you know, that fall leads to, hey, I'll do that class in the spring. And that leads to, you know, me going to Rutgers and training at Rutgers. Ooh, I'll do the class you know, and just kept getting put off, put off, put off. It's one class. I didn't think it was the end of the world and just get, get, kept getting put off. Then uh, when Carrie called me to coach there, I was a little embarrassed that I couldn't say I graduated. You know, it was two credits and, and it was kind of like a pride thing. So I called Tom and I was like, listen, can I train at the RTC this season and, uh, and finish this last class? And the last class was boxing. It was a boxing class. That's Come all it was. On. Yeah. Come on. So like, Listen, more honesty, more honesty. Listeners, I was not a good student. I was not a good student. Somehow I'm at Harvard, right? But I was not a good student. I actually had a low GPA uh, where I had to have a two credit course to make it higher. I had all my credits completed, but I needed uh, just another two credit course and I had to get an A in it. So I had a high enough GPA to graduate. And um, they said, hey, you want to do boxing? And I was like, yeah, I'll punch people in the face just to graduate. That'd be sick. So I got an A in that, obviously. And then I was good to go. <laughs> That's awesome. I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. I don't tell a lot of people I didn't graduate because I, I like to think that I'm not an idiot. But, uh, but I mean, how many kids are in that situation, right? In the wrestling world, right? People oh, totally. Story. You know what's actually a situation I see a lot more kids, which uh, hopefully kids are listening can hear this. I see a lot more kids that will be a state placer, state qualifier, or maybe never even qualified for states and are questioning if they should wrestle in college. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never had that perspective until post-college. It's the same exact thing when it comes to wrestling at the U.S. Open. I'll get the same. Why is Johnny still wrestling? He didn't win the nationals. Most guys that continue wrestling after college, they're like a national champ, multiple time all American, et cetera. So I had a little bit of insecurity and embarrassment for what other people might think. Why is Johnny still wrestling? And actually it was Kyle Snyder that said, do you want to wrestle? And I said, yeah. And he goes, okay, that's all you should do then. You should wrestle. And I was like, that was so simple. Like, holy cow, that, that was so simple. Like, I don't know why I was, I was letting myself worry about what other people were thinking Brainalize, yeah. you know what i mean so so I, I i i equate that to the kid who is is sitting there and obviously money and financial things and being away from i get it right i get that nobody that isn't on scholarship it's not easy it's not easy but if you are able to make it happen financially and you want to and the only thing holding you back is ooh. I don't know if I'm good enough because I never had the, the high school accolades that I wanted to. I never qualified for the state tournament. I never placed in the state tournament or what it is. Freaking wrestle. You like it? Go do it. You know what I mean? So I got a senior this year. That, that feels like that? Go do it. I have a senior. You know, that's important. Same boat. He's like, I, I might try. You know, he's never qualified for state, but he's. Who is it? I, I have a senior from high school. He, he's Go going freaking to wrestle, bro. Yeah, if you that's like what I told him. I was like, try it. We, you know, you. You're going to regret it if you don't try, he's, you know, going to Kenny, uh, and he's, he's a, you know, brainiac, smart kid, but it's like, try yeah, it. He'll figure it out. Yeah. Hooked him up with Malave and he's, he's, you know, he's at case. Yeah. Yeah. He's going to be going next year. Great kid. Nice. You know what I mean? That's awesome. Yeah. Shout out Josh. Yeah. Yes. Right. Awesome guy. Awesome guy. 
I think that's awesome when a person finds a level, right? Like everything's so D one centered, right? Yep. I like it when a kid finds a D three home and they're a great student. And then they're like, you know what? I'm going to give this a try. I like that. I think, you know, that, that, uh, we don't have enough of that. I think there's just so much, uh, Johnny, we've been working with Tig Moore and doing some promotions for him. He's the wrestling consultant. And yeah. his big thing is, you know, being a liaison between the coaches and helping people through the recruiting process at all levels. And obviously that guy knows a lot, you know, he was at Harvard. He knows he's seen the Ivy league, right? Right. He's yeah. And his market's going to be, his market's going to be those kids that are on the fence. Yes. You know, so that's great for them to have. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, just, just thinking about a guy like that though, like there's so much, there's so much to it though, that you got to look at. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, if you're facility hungry or you want to go to the big 10, right. I mean, obviously facilities aren't everything. I mean, and neither is the, 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 the everybody thinks if they offer me a full ride, that's the place I should go. And that bothers me. You know what I mean? That bothers me. I understand money's hard. I get it. I understand tuition's expensive. I get it. But you cannot live and die and think a team cares about you more because they offered you more money. That is a big thing for me. And I've seen it at Rutgers, Kent State, Ohio State, not at Harvard because it's Ivy League. They don't have scholarships. But I see it everywhere. Kids think that, oh, this school offered me a full they care about me more. They'll invest in me more. No, that's not how it works. That's not how it works at all. Right. You know, it's like that old quote. It's that old quote, you know, person A donated a hundred dollars, but had a thousand person B donated $20, but only had $20. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like that old thing. And that's real important to me. You know, so if any kids are listening to that, you know, look past the numbers. It's deeper than that, you know? Right. hundred percent. Or they're stuck on a program. I- I'm only going to this program because it like when you get that degree they're not looking where it's from right exactly exactly Sp- speaking of schools i Walsh guy right did you have any Walsh, growing up Walsh guys you looked up to man come on have you ever seen that wall in that room no i know who is the guys because that, that uh, i go in there and i used to be in sixth grade north akron i would just stare at that wall me ty you know, the Skinesnies, we would just stare at that wall because there's all the names. It's, it's so funny. Like other schools I go to high school wise, there's like charts, right? State champs. And like, it's a chart, you know, and it's like uh, brought in. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, you know, a plaque or something like that that shows it. And for some reason, just the names being painted on the wall like that was so I don't know. It's so cool to me. And, and we would just stare at it all the time with all the names. And they become like, even if I never met them, they became like legends in my head, you know? So obviously the Clints and the Sunnies I knew growing up with that move that I pinned Brewer um, at Vegas and Sonny actually taught me when I was like in fourth grade, you know, which is another thing. I go like layers. I start talking and I think of like 16 other things. Zeb knows he's known me for a while. So I don't know if you know this, but I knocked out his coffee when he was, you know, when he was 26 years old. So, <laughs> <laughs> and then he made me run sprints till I puked. He's abusing. Um, so he, he would have been canceled if it was 2021. This guy would have been out of here. Freaking jerk. Yeah, so, correct. Canceled. So, so uh, coffee for your coffee. Dude, Sonny taught me this move when I was in like fourth grade. Shout out, Sonny. Taught me this move when I was in fourth grade. And the biggest thing I hear coaches say is a kid will hit an inside trip or a sick, slick looking, one of those slick looking moves in high school or junior high. And I see all these like old school coaches say, oh, that won't work at the next level. And I understand what they mean. Coaches, if you're listening, right, don't feel attacked right now. Like I understand what you mean, but you like I never want to take wrestling off the table and that's basically what you're doing by saying that you're eliminating wrestling now is there a difference between a headlock and a single leg of course a hundred percent a single leg is high percentage a headlock is probably low percentage but if a kid has a great headlock or a crit is a great inside trip double down on it triple down on it make it the best ever right i don't want to take wrestling off the table so i'll say things like hey that is a harder move to get on a really good guy but if you're really good there you probably can get it because we've seen people like jason nolf 
you know, fall into a headlock out of nowhere. And you're just like, what the heck? That looked easy. You know what I mean? So I hate the phrase. A big pet peeve for me is that won't work at the next level. I hate that phrase. I think it's, it removes wrestling. It takes wrestling off the table. I don't want to take wrestling off the table for, for a kid. Sonny taught me a low percentage definition by definition, a low percentage move when I was in fourth grade. And I hit it on an NCAA champ in college. And then I teched a guy at the U.S. Open uh, last year with the same move. You know what I mean? So, so, so that's, that's, a big, that's a big thing to me. You know, sorry to, sorry to you know, piggyback off of that question, but, but that, that's important to me. So, okay. Everybody should know this if they've seen you wrestle. Uh, they, it's the same move. The barrel roll, What's they up? know the dump's coming, right? Yeah, I mean. You see those, Deb? You can't, yeah, you, you I, I know the gorilla hands. I know the banana you call, hands. You, okay? yeah, you called it something else. I was wrestling Brewer at Ohio State. Ironically, second time wrestling Brewer. You called me banana hands. People still call me that. You're, cause you, dude, look at him. Looks like it. Looks like it. <laughs> come on. What's that look like? Well, hold those up. Come on. Dude, it was you and Bader. You and Ian. You and Ian. Ian. Ian and Johnny. But it, dude, he's got gorilla hands, banana hands, too. How's, how's he doing? He's great. He's done at App State. They had five App conference State, yeah, champs. That. That's an awesome. All-American. Their 49 punter was an All-American. So, they, yeah, they're doing great. Now, my uh, other nephew's had it down there. My other nephew, Wyatt Miller, won state this year for Oak Harbor. He's a yeah. mutant. Good. So, good for him. Yeah. Uh, so, Ian Wyatt's Miller, had it down there. Ian Miller's probably the one person that didn't wrestle past college that I wish did. I wish – and he's a guy who would throw an inside trip from – you know, across the mat and land it. You know what I mean? He was sick. And I always saw him at all these tournaments and I would just look at him and be like, dude, I want you to rest so bad because he was so good. I remember the first team, you guys, they picked you up for a team. They picked you up for maybe Cleveland duels or Beachwood duels or something. Cle- no, it's Cleveland State. Cleveland State, they picked you up. And my brother Ferd called me. He's like, you got to see this DeJulius kid. You know, who Ian beat that love day? that you did. You'd always show your hands after a move. You know who Ian beat that day at Cleveland State? We were in fifth grade. You know who he beat? Bo Jordan. Bo Jordan. You beat Bo yeah. Jordan. <laughs> He's undefeated against the Jordans. That's crazy. I think the last time he beat Isaac was in the uh, NCAA quarterfinals. I remember that. Wow. Yeah. He beat Isaac in the, in the quarters and then lost to Ness the next round. But uh, here's the wild thing. I remember Ferd talking about you, and you were, dude, this was second or third grade. Yeah, it was a long time ago, was it? Okay. Yeah, no, yeah, second or third grade, because you you had not knocked my coffee over yet. <laughs> and um, he's talking about, he's like, I love how he wrestles. And he was just talking about how you would show your hands, like you'd do a tilt, and then you'd show Who's your that? Bernie? No, Ferd. My brother Ferd was oh, like, oh, oh, he shows oh, his hands. Thing. He shows the ref his hand. It's awesome. You love it. So Bo Bassett does that now. Oh, that's so funny. I like Bassett. He's a stud, huh? He's unreal. But, like, that's what I think of. I'm like, oh, yeah, Johnny was doing that as a first, second, third grader, showing his – did you have banana hands then? Come on. I was born with these things. They were born with big gorilla hands. Okay. So, But, yeah, like, he, I remember he was talking about that. They picked you up for a duel, and then you just, like, smashed everybody, and you kept showing your hands after all these tilts. That's right. They got to make sure, you know, the ref sees, hey, listen, these look good, but I'm also releasing the move. I'm, I'm not holding on. <laughs> these are not a hand transplant from a man, from a 40-year-old man uh, who works at an auto, an, uh, uh, an auto worker. These are not his hands. They did not transplant them on me. You know, it's funny. This is like kind of my, my theory. Uh, you know, Victor Voinovich, obviously. Yeah. His dad used to make me hang from a pull-up bar for as long as I can, like several days a week, like two, two days a week, you know? And, uh, at first when you just dead hang like that, you know, you get, um, oops, sorry, hiccups. You get, uh, you get maybe two minutes and it hurts. I mean, I'm like young and you can always go harder when you're younger. Right. Like I'm saying youth wise, I would like go till I cried, you know? And eventually that hang got me up to about, eight minutes, eight minutes. And I'm not going to act like, I don't know. Eight minutes and 36 seconds was my PR, but <laughs> I'm sitting like here a like, flex, like a like flex remember it. hanging straight, straight hang. This, straight this hang. is a little bicep hangs a little harder, but straight hang. I got eight minutes and 36 seconds. Wow. So honestly, Mufasa was a wimp. 
All right, because I could have hung on that cliff with Scar a lot longer than he did, first of all. Second of all, if I was ever in a James Bond movie, I could hang off a helicopter a lot longer than the, the, the villain does. Third of all, Russ Hellickson said this to me one time. He said, he said, if you have a fishing hook, if you have a fishing rope that can pull a thousand pounds, but the hooks, right, your hooks can only pull five pounds, it doesn't matter. It does not matter. And I, I thought about that and I was like, dude, that's so true. Like the hook needs to be able to pull a thousand pounds. That's the one that's the most important for wrestling, you know? So, so grip was kind of like everything to me. I, I stress that a lot. I love, I love grip stuff. You know, I like, I like Barrel knowing off. That grip battle. Barrel wall, fireman's. Come on, come on. You know it. Yeah. Me and Deacon Mello used to just grip, grip each other to death. Every match we would just hang onto each other's wrists. So it was your grip workouts. <laughs> Just hanging, straight hang, and hanging, and and you know, you, so stuff perfect. like that. Farmers walks, everybody knows. You know, you just walk with the dumbbells, um, dumbbell holds, which is similar. Um, hanging, I didn't really use like the, the stress balls or anything like that. I didn't do much with those, but um, it wasn't my grip. I could squeeze stronger, or yeah, squeeze stronger. It was it was uh, like longevity. I could, my grip was the same in the first minute as the seventh minute. You know what I mean? It, it was no, that you know, stamina was good. Endurance, yeah. Usually yeah. you back up a cradle and it's like, ah, your arms are jello. Exactly. So, exactly. so is that, uh, you know, we got to talk about your, your being, being a daredevil, right? Is that why you're so comfortable hanging from stuff? Like people, you know, freaking out and you're like, ah, I got, got this. I can do it with one hand. A lot of people see it and they think like, oh, he's fearless. I am not fearless. Right. I think if, you know, there's all these tough macho dudes out there like, oh, yeah, nothing scares me. You're an idiot then because I have climbed mountains. You know, Zeb, you climb mountains, shout out. I've climbed mountains, swam with sharks and, and base jumped off stuff. And I'm terrified. Like, trust me, I'm not fearless. You know, bees, bees scare me. So, <laughs> but uh, I think um, you swim think with sharks, some- you swim with sharks, but bees scare you. Sharks scare me too, dude. Come on. <laughs> but I uh actually, I saw my sharks yesterday, actually. Yesterday I was with some bull sharks. <laughs> Seen that. Where? Where? I was in Jupiter, Florida yesterday. So with some bull sharks. I got Miles that's, Martin that's to swim. Jaws is literally a bull shark, you idiot. I got, I got Miles Martin to swim with a bull shark yesterday. It was pretty cool. Um but uh so they have um I'm trying to explain this the best I can. Um when it comes to that adventurous stuff, obviously like regular adventurous things, like certain hikes, maybe like the 40 foot cliff jump, that stuff's all fun and games. A lot of people call me selfish when, uh, when I start base jumping. Now, for those who don't know, skydiving is out of a plane. Base jumping is an acronym that stands for building, antenna, span, and earth. Span is bridges, earth is cliffs, you know, sheer high enough cliffs that we can jump off of. Now, skydiving has the height, right? Altitude and height is very dramatic. But the lower you get, the much more dangerous it is. You know, a skydive, I land in the middle of a field. I land into the wind. The wind slows me down. Base jumping, you don't have that luxury. You know, I'm I'm illegally on top of a building in downtown Cleveland, you know, and I got to worry about crosswinds coming up the streets. Maybe I'm landing downwind. It's going to, you know, five mile an hour downwind will really put you on your face will really put you on your face. It is not a fun day. You know, you got, you know, street signs and power lines and cars and, you know, people videotaping. It's just a whole nonsense of stuff. Not to mention you're only 200 feet above the ground, you know? So, so it's, it's scary. Right. And people will be like, why do you do it? Do you like escaping death? And no, that's not it. That's not it at all. Here's what it is. When I'm doing things, you know, like everyday things, going to the grocery store, watching movies, whatever. Everybody has stresses in their head. You know, for some people, ooh, rent's due tomorrow. For some people, I just got in a fight with my significant other. Whatever it is, right? Life happens. One thing that I can promise you, you will never be more present in your entire life is when you exit from a structure. And if I'm on top, of that thing. There's a million what ifs that are going through my head. 
What if my parachute doesn't open? What if this, what if this, what if this? Oh my gosh, this is so scary. I'm terrified. I say three, two, one, see ya. I don't hesitate. The second my feet leave, there is no other place my mind is except in that exact moment. It is total flow state. And really the only other place I ever get that present is when you're wrestling. You know what I mean? You have that in wrestling where you're just like, there could be a fire in the stands next to you. You'd have no freaking idea. You're right. Re- you know what I mean? You're just in the middle of a match. Sometimes I don't even hear coaches yelling at me. It's the same exact thing. Now, obviously the consequences are a lot greater when you're jumping off of an object, right? Than, than losing a match. But you can also understand that present feeling is that much more, you know, multiplied as well. So, so that's why I do it. So don't think it's like escaping death. You know, it's, 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 it's a feeling you can't really describe, you know, it's pretty cool. It centers you, right? It's your meditation it centers, exactly. centers you and you know, brings you back. Right. So- and no, nothing's really fun unless there's progression. You know, everybody says like the, the point of life is to be happy. I, I think that's BS. I think, I think one of the most important things about, you know, life is, is, is purpose and uh, purpose. It doesn't have to be like your passion per se, but like growth, you know what I mean? You know, if wrestling was easy, you know, you wouldn't have these people trying to come in and, and, and puzzle solve and figure it out. So the fact that skydiving, um, it's not just falling. It has like, like, like levels of growth. Hey, I'm here and I progress to here and I progress. That's fun in anything you do. That's fun. So I, I like that side of it a lot. So if uh, listeners should watch one of your videos, what should it be or what should they search for? Right. Cause some people are doing it like, who is this guy that does, they know you're wrestling side, but they might, might not. Right. On socials. So I had one video go viral so far on my Instagram. Uh, it was, it's funny, you know, what, what, what hits and what doesn't hit. Right. right. Like a big throw in wrestling is going to look really cool to a non-wrestling fan like wow that was sick right but to us a real high level snap down go behind chase the ankle we would be like holy cow that was sick and somebody else might not appreciate that as much you know what i mean or like a hard two minute ride out like we appreciate how hard a two minute ride out is you know what i mean so i've done all these crazy things like all these crazy things that would be equivalent to like a two minute ride out, something very difficult. But the one that decided to go viral was a skydive from like 5,000 feet that really was not that risky or hard. You know what I mean? It was in a hot air balloon. Uh, my buddy, Anthony DiCarlo, who also uh, skydives with me and wrestled with me at Ohio State, I hung from his arm and then he let me go. And, you know, Sports Center reposted it, Barstool, Nitro Circus. And it was pretty funny. But, uh, you know, it's funny how that works. You know, I did all these crazy ones and then that's the one I just did as a joke. And that's the one that, that, that got some traction, you know, <laughs> you did the, the windmill at Kenston high school, didn't you? That I have no comment on Zeb. <laughs> no comment. Got it. Well, I'll, I'll, here, here's all I'm going to say. Here's all I'm going to say. <laughs> I take Ferd there to learn how to ride his bike, and Tommy does. Uh, and like, you look up and you say, "My boy was on that." No, no, I did it one day on my story, and you're like, "Is that at Kenston?" And I was like, "Yeah, it's at Kenston." And you're like, "Yeah, I jumped off that." Yeah, baby. And I was like, "Wow." So here's my thing with that: Have you made missteps yet, where have you had to impromptu throw the shoot? Yeah. So like everything is, is a lot of, um, there's a lot of math that goes in, you know, like if, if an object, uh, antenna or a cliff or whatnot is, um, only 250 feet, you have to use a different square inch pilot shoot, which is what it catches wind and it pulls your main shoot out. Right. So, and you can, you can give lower, shorter or longer delays of when you throw it based on how much height there is. Right um obviously we do oh my fingers cover the camera sorry we do all that like we it, you know in the business it's called getting the dope right that's like slang for uh for beta you know like the logistical side so oh what's the dope on the antenna or the windmill at kenston high school and i would say oh you gotta land with a north wind because the south wind there's you know trees uh there's this it's only 250 feet security's here there's a camera on this floor there's this. there's all these things that go into it and you kind of feel like remember the feeling when you were eight years old and you would ding dong ditch it was like so fun i get to have that again 
because I'm, I'm I'm doing something not that bad, but I'm still like evading, you know, care. And that's fun. You know what I mean? That's fun to be an eight year old again, except okay. I'm jumping off. Something. Okay. So, so Kenston, mm-hmm. if I were to jump off the windmill at Kenston, which I know you can land, that's a big parking lot. You can land I anywhere. I didn't know that, you know, I don't think you did that, but I heard maybe you did. Right. Maybe. It Where does someone like, land at Kenston in the stadium or on the parking lot? Yeah, you wouldn't make it to the stadium right in the parking lot because that, that it, it's in the middle of the parking lot. So you can land pretty no, much anywhere. No, you can jump the, right yeah. down into the stadium, actually. That thing's right next to the stadium. Yeah, I got to remember. I, I, I don't I, – I know I landed in the parking lot, but I'm trying to think of, of – <laughs> No, of how if close you did that, you didn't do that, though. No, I didn't do that. No. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. So the dopamine release. What it does is it, list, it releases, the, releases the neurotransmitter dopamine, right? This is just like what a lot of drugs do. Like if you're a meth addict, you got to have more. You got to have more. You got to have more, right? Because your body builds a tolerance to it. It's just like anything, right? 100%. Okay. Um, what is the dopamine? Like, what does it take now to, to get you the high now? I, uh, I have done a good job of being able to appreciate adventure-wise the extreme side, but also something that gets my dopamine to that same level is uh the beauty side of something so like you know i know you've been to crater lake and you've done a lot of pacific northwest exploring stuff like that would have the same effect i love chasing the creative side of content creating right like ooh, i like how this looks this is very pretty looking i want to take pictures of that so that gives me the same high um where where i lack actually is i feel withdrawals like mentally if i haven't done something for a few weeks like that adventurous so it doesn't have to be death defying every time it could be a hike or it could be something you know fun that just gets your heart rate up a little bit or makes you say wow but i need to do it every few weeks because i've just done it so much now that's the bad part you know i i I really feel like a withdrawal mental like depression if i haven't done something in a while it's like really bad okay (laughs) that's my smile right now i just ran with bull sharks yesterday (laughs) the the glacier one when you guys were doing the stuff in glacier and you you rode the going to the sun road did you guys go to kalispell is that where you bought your bikes from yeah flew into kalispell so we went there and because of covid everything was closed and uh we couldn't ride up the going to the sun road which is a 15 mile drive we couldn't drive up through logan pass through logan pass that's what we want we want to get to logan pass so we couldn't drive start out of, Did you start out at Lake McDonald and do Avalanche? Lake, all that, right? Yeah, we parked at Lake McDonald. Okay. And all the all the bikes in the national park were sold out that day because obviously no cars can go up. Everybody was biking. And all the bikes in in the place are motorbikes. They're like electric. So like you can just zip, zip up. You know what I mean? And it's a six degree incline the entire way. You know you've been there. It is steep. You know what I mean? It is steep. We go to Walmart and we bought uh, mongoose little trick bikes, single gear, oh right? We God. bought them for 70, 80 bucks. <laughs> we rode all the way up. We got to Logan Pass and we stopped because we saw wildlife. We saw bears and goats and all that stuff. And we wanted to look. A, a, a park ranger comes down. So we drove 15 miles up road 50 miles up and we walked the bikes at times obviously nobody could do that it was freaking exhausting park ranger goes this part of the park is closed you have to turn you have to turn back and we looked at him and we were in so such defeat now going down was like a roller coaster i didn't have to pedal one time which was great but it was 50 miles up 50 miles down and the next day we had a whole nother day there jake ryan looks at me and goes what do you want to do today and i said let's do it again maybe we won't see rangers this time (laughs) And we freaking did it again. This time we got to Logan Pass. We got to see Pyramid Lake. We didn't get to do um, what's the high line? We didn't get to do the high line. Do the high line? No, we didn't do the high line. Oh, I, I gotta know. send you the video. Of my wife and I walking on the high line. You, I. That's a ridge walk, a ge- right? I'm not a geometry guy. I think you could base. And I asked you this because I've. I think I've sent you the video. It's my wife walking in front of me, and a person walks by me. Yeah, I think you could base jump off of the high line. It's just the, oh, I'm I sure there's a lot of sheer cliffs in that. There's in that a place. lot of sheer cliffs. Yeah, so we did the high line. We did the high you, line you to like the. Uh, you do a lot of hiking. A Granite lot Park of Chalet, Granite Park Chalet, and then we we hiked down because then you got to go from Granite Park Chalet 
And then we hiked up the uh, onto the Continental Divide, ran into a couple oh, of uh, mountain goats and, and uh, rams. It was awesome, man. I um, you know, I I, I uh, for the listeners, you know, I, I hope that uh, that if they're only into wrestling when they listen to this podcast. What I hope is that they realize, like kids, you need to have a life outside of wrestling. That's very important. You know what I mean? Like have a hobby. I don't care if it's if it's knitting, right? For me and Zeb, it's it's hiking. You know, I'm not sure what what you know what you do outside of wrestling, but having a life outside of wrestling is very important. Um, what I've seen is people live and die by thinking wrestling is is the end all be all. Now, making wrestling your life is great. That's awesome. I love that. It's my life. It's it's our lives. We we've done that our you know for forever, but a side effect of that that I've seen is people look down on people that don't wrestle. For example, I saw this poll came out Sports Center. What's the hardest sport? Wrestling was like second or third. Swimming was hardest, right? And all these wrestlers were offended. They were like, they were like, dude, wrestling's the hardest, and you know, biased. What am I going to say? I think wrestling is the hardest, of course, but I wasn't offended by that. There's a lot of people out there that work hard that don't wrestle. You know what I mean? There's a lot of people that were firefighters that are badass people that never wrestled. People who fought and died for this country that never wrestled. Really good mothers and fathers that never wrestled. So while I love wrestling, I think wrestling is very important. Understand it's just a tool. You know, you're not great because you wrestle. I know, forgive me for cursing, but I know douchebags that are really good at wrestling and unbelievable people who never step foot on the mat. You know what I mean? And that's just the truth, you know? So having a life outside of wrestling and perspective, whether it's through hiking, like me and Zeb traveling, or it's through, you know, um, another hobby, whatever it is, I think it's very important for wrestlers to have. I think it's very important. Great great point. Great point. You know, like people... We've had this conversation in the past with guests, you know, you've had these goals of wrestling and then wrestling's over, you know, competition wise. Then it's like, then what? Right. It's like, you know what, you know what they say also, I realized this, they, they set their goals wrong in their head, be a state champ, be an all American, be national champ, whatever it is. And they do it. Right. Mm -hmm. And they say, Oh, that's it. That I don't feel like a state champ. Like that's it. That this is what it feels like because they lived and died by results instead of decisions. You know what I mean? Or it's like, you know, mm-hmm. you feel fulfillment when you're, when you're, when you're a, hey, the decision to eat, right. The decision to train, right. I'm going to live this lifestyle rather than like do this task Win States check. Right. It's not that it's, it's goals in my Travel told me goals should not be to do's like a checklist. Mm-hmm. It should be to be's. I want to be this kind of individual. I don't want to win states. I want to be the best in the state. And there's a difference between that. There's a big difference. You know what I mean? And when you do achieve that goal, you feel because you are a byproduct of all the decisions, you feel like that individual as opposed to you just check something off a list. So I, I, that's very important to me. I like that you said that. that that's very important. Yeah, right. And those guys that have the wrong perspective, right? It, everyone's calling, yeah, congrats, congrats. And then the phone stops ringing, you know, their life's empty. Right. Totally. If their perspective totally. is off, it's, you know, you're a national champ and, and that was oh, going to be, you know, that's the goal. And then, you know, everyone's congrats, congrats. And then it's, it's up. over. Yeah. It's Not over. Not even that. I, I mean, uh, I, oh, sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. Good. Go. No. I used to, uh, when I wrestled Ohio state, you know, you'd win, you'd have a good win. You know, I'd be Clark or Montoya or somebody that was a high, high level wrestler. And you'd go back to your phone in the locker room and a zillion people would have tweeted at you. The Instagrams, everybody's tagging you. Everybody's storying you. Everybody's posting you. You have 50, 60 texts from people in high school that, that, that watched your Big Ten network match. You know, if you win. When you lose, it is empty. Oh. It, is, it is like night and day right right it is like night and day it is crazy so that's where you you cannot rely on the affirmation to just be your goal or you know why you do it it can't be your why it's got to be love i love what i do and then each thing i think about is decisions i i do this because i know it's the right thing to do you know not you know it's got to be the affirmation is nice you're allowed to appreciate it 
right. can't live and die by it because it won't be there all the time. You will lose, yep. right? If a coach says you're going to go undefeated, he's a liar. You will right. lose. Yes. You will lose. Unfortunately, you will lose. Love it, man. Good stuff for sure. I, I, yeah, I know exactly how you feel because, you know, you talk about not being an All-American, right? But I want you to think about this. Just wrap your brain around this. So I'm the youngest of, of four boys. I have a mm-hmm. sister too. All three of my brothers were state champs. I was not a state champ. Now, the other crazy thing is now I have two nephews that are state champs. state champs. Right? Yeah. Two nephews that are state champs. And now I have two more nephews left. I have two sons. I'm still the only one to not want to, you know, there's, there's five of them now. There's five. Think about it. It's not there's five. Idea. There's five guys of yeah, one state in my family. Right. Johnny. It's like, it's not, I don't know. It's hard. It oh, can't explain it. Right. I mean, cause same scenario, brother. And we know my brother's story, right? It's not. Yeah. Oh my not, gosh. Yeah. It's not yeah. the end all be all though. You know what I mean? It's like, if I, if you, you know, I don't know. It's hard to explain, but it doesn't so, define so, me as a person. No, it doesn't, I, but it's that, like, that, but I am who I am because of it. Right. So there's a, uh, I, I like paraphrasing Travel. I think he dissects stuff. Well, um, he would say this, he would say, never take practice home with you. You're not an identity. You're not uh, identified by your results. And we've all heard that. Right. And he would go like a step further explaining it to me. Let's say Tomasello beat me at practice. I would go home and I'll be pissed off. Be like, what the hell? How'd he beat me today? And the whole reason I'm mad is because result wise, I think he's better at wrestling than me that day, right? Because he beat me. Now, he would say your result never goes home with you. But what does go home with you is the choices you make. For example, if I chose in the three minute go at practice to shoot one time, right? Get a takedown, he escapes. And then do for two minutes and 45 seconds, do zero. And I win two to one. I won. I get to go home and pout my chest. But what becomes a part of who I am? I'm not a risk taker. I'm not somebody who gets very tough. I don't want to risk anymore because in case, in case I lose, you know what I mean? Those things become a part of my personality. You're not you know? progress, right? On the flip side, if I shoot 15 times and he beats me, he spins behind me every single time and I lose 30 to 15, right? The result doesn't go home with me. What does go home with me, though, you know, I'm somebody who 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 is willing to put it on the line. You know, those type of things, those decisions that I made become a part of my personality. They become a part of who I am. My identity is that. So that's very important. to me. You know, you could be a terrible person and get married. Right. And you can call yourself, hey, I'm 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 somebody who who is desirable or you could be the best person in the world and never get married. But. But one of them is, is, is not a good person just because they have the result. You know what I mean? They have the successful relationship. They're not a good person. So the result doesn't always make the wrestler in my eyes. It's, it's what they choose to do. Just like the result wouldn't make, you know, the individual in the relationship or, or whatever, you know, you can equate it to. Um, um, I'm trying to think of a good analogy off the top of my head, but, you know, if you get where I'm going. Well, my big thing is I don't like it when you compare me to hiking like you because I could never keep up with you hiking. Dude, you've done some. I've never done Crater Lake. Crater I, Lake is easy. Crater Lake's got this thing hike. called the Cleetwood. You could not do the. You could not base jump Crater Lake. No, I just want to go because it's so. Blue. I think you Beautiful. might be able to, but the problem with Crater Lake is it slopes down pretty good, and it's not as sheer. But there's right. a couple places that you might be able to actually jump off. And I'm not a geometry person. Apparently, you are when it comes to base jumping. I yeah. would never do that. Like, well, you know, eight, eight, eight years at Ohio State, you know, I was getting my doctor, you know? <laughs> yeah. That's right. Most Harvard, Harvard guy doctors. now, Harvard man now. That's true. He's a Harvard man. I like that. But like, what's crazy is this summer I, I went hiking with Kevin Roberts and his family. How's he doing? Like, he's awesome. His 12 year old daughter was dusting me, though, like crushing. Yeah. Me just walking right up the side of this mountain like it was nothing and i'm like dude i'm gassed out i was wearing this barbarian apparel shirt and if you sweat and they were all wearing them too because he he, uh josh mailed them out to him and when you sweat this thing shows up the the barbarian this thing sweat activated thing in the background what's through well everybody (laughs) 
at my shirt was soaked like a college wrestling practice and the barbarian came through. None of them even broke a sweat. <laughs> That's awesome. That's funny. You know what you would like, Zeb? Yeah. No, go. You've been to, uh, by chance, Jackson Hole? Of course. So about an hour south is the Wind River Range. Yes. And uh, me and Bryce Meredith hiked this thing. It's very little. Like, he lives in Wyoming. I showed him a picture of this I thing. I watched that, that whole story, and right. people were like, oh, that's so beautiful. You guys bushwhacked. I was commenting the whole time. I was like, no, you. you don't understand how hard this is, what they're doing. Because you guys, it was it. unbelievable. You even I, I, mentioned that, John. You're like, I, right? Like how hard it was to get to that point, right? Dude, I was on there at one point, And I only remember, like, I always said nothing is as hard. And this goes against kind of what I said earlier about, like, living and dying by wrestling. But nothing was as hard as, like, the third period in a Big Ten match, right? Like, nothing's that hard, right? But, dude, when I was climbing on that thing, there was a point where I sat down and I said, I don't want to be here anymore. Like, I was so freaking tired, dude. I did Listen, not want to be there I got anymore. it already. You ready? I got oh. it. Go on a hike or a climb unprepared. Go on a hike or climb unprepared. It's the hardest thing you'll ever do in your life because it becomes you got a blisters. You got no yeah. food. You if got you run out of water, you are screwed. And the other thing is, if you just drink only water, you need to have electrolytes and other things because drinking water is, is great. But the crazy yeah. thing about it is if you just drink water and you got, dude, you have to have so many snacks. You need calories. So calories that you, you need have to calories. Consume, it would blow your mind. Cause I did, I've done uh Mount St. Helens. Like it's Mount St. Helens is not a super hard climb, but it you juices you out. It, it juices, juices you. I remember I wasn't prepared for it the first time I ever did it with my best friend, John Watkins. And I remember being like coming down. I'm like, dude, this is hard. Even this walking really flat. Hard. That's what people don't understand. Going down's harder. Yes. Going, or for me, going I'm down's huge. Harder. 250 so, pounds, 255 pounds. Think about that. What are you, 140, 140, 145? What are you walking 145, around? 145, dog. Think about that. I'm carrying 110, 110 more pounds than you, which whatever. It's a choice. I'm fat. Plus like, a tent, plus food. Yes. Plus yes. I'm older than you. you need, right, to make I got old right. man knees. You know what I mean? Like there's all these other factors. And then the elevation becomes a factor as oh, well. Yeah. And people don't understand that. But what's crazy about those Cascades and the Pacific Northwest ones, a lot of the stuff you'll do will be at sea level if you're in Seattle or if you're in Portland. And then you go and you can do day trips. You, you know, like I've only ever camped out at Mount St. Helens once at the base camp, right. Climbers Bivac, which is like 2,600 feet or something. And then you walk the permit line, it's 4,800 feet. And then 4,800 feet to 5,300 or 8,300 feet is the, the, the summit. And, you know, because half the mountain got blown off, 1,200 feet of elevation. Talking geometry, I thought you said you didn't know geometry. You're talking geometry. And that's simple this math. This guy's smart. Simple yeah. math. But the crazy thing is when you're at sea level, when you're in Portland at sea level and you're out the night before late drinking heavy beer. Oh and yeah. Then you go to climb a mountain the next day. It's that not that easy. No, that's funny. You said that people don't realize it either. Like you take a walk down the street on flat ground, you know, just a walk, you know, it's, it's, it's not the end of the world. Even if the hike is flat, when the ground is, is the, the, there's rocks that like it's uneven. The right? volcanic ash would blow your mind on a lot when of these mountains. That's what I'm saying. When it's uneven oh. like that, it wears your hips out, your knees. Everything. There, there's so many times where I'll hike. It's not that hard of a hike. It's only five, six, seven miles, but I'll do it so fast or, or, or just, you know, a little underprepared where I'm thinking like, wow, my body's hurting right now. This is tough. This is tough. You know, it's, it's crazy how it gets to you. You know, so that one was 25 miles, the square top mountain. That was 25 miles round trip. What was your game? And what was your elevation game? Five, uh, yeah, 5,000 foot elevation game. Dude, that's crazy. Yeah, that's it was hard. crazy. That's yeah. crazy. And people don't understand the elevation game. It is drastic because there's 5,000 foot elevation game without, without a trail. 5,000 foot elevation game without a trail. Yeah, you At back. one point, though, once we cleared the trail line, there was rock piles, which obviously, you know, the rock piles is where other hikers have been. So we can kind of like follow those, but holy cow, I was, 
I wanted to cry. I, I'm not I, even I acting like I could do that. I'm not even going to act was, like I could do what you guys did. I could do it if I had like my brother with me, my brother Tate and I, and we were supporting one another, and we were and take some days, take some days. To get there. I would have to, I would have to do that over two or th- at least three days. You know, I, I, to, to say, <laughs> you guys did that in a day, didn't you? Day and a half, yeah. Yeah, I couldn't do that. That would take yeah. if I, I would take four or five days to do that. And the more I'm thinking about it, because what you're talking about, elevation gain, you bushwhacked, you figured it out. You guys were just doing dead reckoning, weren't you? You were just like eyeballing everything, right? Yeah, we. I mean, we had all trails, but there's no service out there, so we were just kind so of deadly. What yeah. you guys are doing is so dangerous. But <laughs> hey, we had bear, we had bear mace. We had bear mace. We were good. Uh, you're good. Hey, you're Johnny, good. I got bad news for you. What? What if the wind's blowing in your face? I. That's a good point. I. I, I, I didn't mean to break your heart. Oh my god. <laughs> I carry a, a a Glock, a Glock twenty one. Which is a Dude, that bear stuff is real. It's very scary. Dude, it's very not scary. Like, the bear wins. Some dude, dude yelled I, at me. Hey, a guy yelled at me in front of my nephews at Glacier. He's like, I guess the bear doesn't really have a chance. And I'm like, yeah, that's kind of the point. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I want to I wanna be able to protect my family. I my 100%. I'm not going out there to hunt them. I don't I was want like, to dude, die. I he was like, oh, oh, you're here to kill bears. And I said, I don't want to hurt anything. No, said, but if it's me, my family and I, or the bear, I want to, I want to oh, be able to pick, yeah. home with them. 100%. And Dude, it was like I, awkward when I'm sleeping in that tent, every sound, I think I'm going to get eaten. I'm just like, what, the, what, the, what, the, you know, if you think I'm like fearless, like I jump off cliffs and stuff, dude, uh, bears in the woods is so scary. So scary. <laughs> and the grizz, or, the grizz does, dude, it can That's run 35 the mile an hour. Me and Jake Ryan actually had an encounter with a black bear in uh, Alberta. We were up in Alberta hiking. And um, on the way to the hike, we were in our car, saw a bear on the side of the road, pulled over, and we were pretty far from it. So I got out of the car to film on my phone. For some reason, we lock eyes, me and the bear, and it charges me, bro. It charged. I don't know why I looked at it in its eyes. I like had a staring contest with it and it just read my mind. I was like, let's go. Let's freaking go. I'm going to Khabib you. You know what I mean? And it just <laughs> charged at me, bro. Charged at me. This thing's running at me. And I, I'm like, I have enough time, right? Not calmly. I'm a little freaked out, but get in my car, close the door. I'm good. My window's down. It puts its paws on the window and puts its head inside inside and you want to know the best part not the best part i jump over on a jake ryan's lap into the into the passenger seat right and i'm freaking out oh my god oh my god oh my god God. the best part i had the wherewithal to keep holding my thumb on the instagram i was recording the whole freaking thing bro i had the whole thing down (laughs) talk about wherewithal come on priorities right The important if i'm gonna die it's gonna be filmed i did too much cool stuff so it's just johnny to julius right on instagram that's where people can find yeah you. just okay. add johnny to julius right yeah. so so what's next what's what's uh next or what's the end goal or the big you would think you want to so me and uh, actually i'm glad you asked that this is um this is kind of new i haven't really talked about it too much publicly me and bryce meredith actually started a uh, company together uh, that is, you know, adventure based and it's not necessarily adventure based, but for us, you know, that's what speaks to us. So what it is, is, um, it's cool. I was, uh, I was trying to think of like a YOLO, something corny, like a YOLO or something like that, that I can that's hashtag. Right. And that's all I wanted. I wanted like a corny hashtag that represent like how I view life. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I'm sitting there and I'm like, what should I do? What should I do? And my dad calls me one day and, you know, I don't know. You you guys have met my dad, obviously, and, and he's uh, he's kind of the opposite of me. He doesn't ride roller coasters. Uh, he'll get booked to like speak at Atlantis and Bahamas. He'll fly in at eight a.m., fly out at five p.m. after he's done speaking. He just likes to be home. You know, if he if he gets money, he makes money. He keeps it. He doesn't blow it right away. You know, I'm the opposite. I do a clinic. I make a couple thousand bucks. I'm on the next flight to freaking Egypt. You know what I mean? I'm just gone. You know, I'll blow next week's pay. You know, I'm just, it's so irresponsible, right? Now, as irresponsible as it is, there's a lot more people, if that's a spectrum, that are 
too much on the responsible side, as in like, there's always a reason not to do something, you know, Hey, should I go to Greece? Oh, you know what? You know, it's not the right time for me. When is the right time? You know what I mean? So my dad is actually kind of giving it to me one day on the phone and he goes, you live life on permanent spring break. <laughs> and I'm just sitting there like, Oh God, you know, he's just yelling at me. You live life on permanent spring break. Uh, you don't care about tomorrow. You only live for today. And he hangs up. I call Bryce. I'm like, dude, what do you think about hashtag no tomorrow? And he's like, I love that. It's has, it's probably trademarked at this point. It's commonly, you know, not a uncommon, but common phrase. We search it trademarks, not in use. We shorten it to TMRW, right? Tomorrow like that. And basically what it means to us is what makes you feel so present where you're not thinking about uh, that you hate Mondays, you know, the job that you hate, I hate Mondays. I can't wait for Friday. Can't wait for 5 PM quitting time. You know, I'm looking forward, looking forward, kind of like click remote Adam Sandler, right? What makes you fall in love with right now? You know what I mean? So what we did was we started a podcast actually hasn't been released yet. Started a podcast uh, where we're going to share stories about, you know, just gnarly people doing adventurous things that, that, that they felt super present and passionate about. Um, people who, who instead of saying, Oh, one day I'm going to go to Greece one day, I'm going to open, you know, this, this passion store that I've always wanted. One day I'm going to start a podcast. One day I'm going to be an actor and they chose to do it. You know what I mean? People. And then on top of all that, so not only did we start the podcast, we, hold on, I got to get it. We threw it on some clothes. So I got a whole thing coming, getting ready. So I'm going to be jumping off of planes I'll send you guys one, but I'm going to be jumping off a plane from now on where no tomorrow right there. So I hopefully love it. Be pretty cool. So try to inspire some people, you know, to, to make the most of the moment, right? 100%. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll interview you guys for, uh, you know, Zeb, Zeb's crazy ass hiking Crater Lake. <laughs> uh, okay. So real quick. Real quick, last thing I have for, I mean, that's not last. I Dude, mean, I can talk all listen, night. Don't say last. Listen, don't, straight don't up, night. we got to be honest with you. We really, Stop. it was my fault. It wasn't Jared's fault. We took almost two hours of Anthony Ashnault's time. Yeah. And I'm still apologizing to him for it. And he's cool. He was cool. The show was I great. I lived with Snolty. I lived with him in Rutgers. Really? He's one great of my guy. favorite. I love him. Awesome. Dude, he's one of my really favorite good. He, he's the next, the next show you'll see pop up of ours. It's him. Nice. And he was awesome. And he, you know what, man, he never complained. He was awesome about it. But we do have to be, it is the barbarian hour. (laughs) He was like, yeah, the barbarian hour and 48 minutes. (laughs) That's what he said. It was something funny. Snolty was mobbing for two hours. I love it. Yeah, he's cool, though. But anyhow, here's, here's here's the big one for me. After it's all said and done, or or let's listen. I know we don't want to think negatively. Of course, Stop. you're doing what you love. It's a pothole. Listen, it's a pothole, right? But maybe, unfortunately, unfortunately, we all have a timeline. So if that's the direction you're going, I understand. Go ahead. When when the time is up, when you right. when you do your last base jump or something goes wrong or just doesn't. I know you've broken your ankle. You know, base jumping uh, yeah, on that cliff. cliff. Yeah, but you know, what do you want people to know about what you did and 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 if 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 it doesn't go your way, man, that, then no, you don't make it question. out. And you, you don't feel like you're getting dark because unfortunately it's, it's, it's reality. You know what I mean? You know, we could die driving to work. We could die hiking the high line, you know, it's just what, what it is. Um, we could choke on dinner tomorrow night, but, but what I would want to be remembered for, that's a great question. Um, you ever heard of the term big talk? Yes right? Like, you know, for listeners, small talk, I call it Thanksgiving talk. You know, it's when your aunt and uncle say, Hey, how, how are you? How's school? How's how's the weather? How you doing? How are your kids doing? Small talk. Yeah. Big talk is is real questions. So first of all, I appreciate that question because that that's big talk that that's, that's an in-depth question. But what I want to be remembered for is, um, obviously a great son, great father, if I ever have kids and, and, and stuff along those lines. Um, but I, I think I kind of know what you're getting at lifestyle wise. I'd want to be remembered for uh, someone who had great energy 
not energetic, not energetic, but just unbelievable energy. You could see the life inside of me, smile wise, personality wise. When I can't come into rooms, I want, I want people to, to, I want it to be contagious. You know, I want other people to be inspired by that. Um, excited, motivated, whatever it is. Uh, I, I've, I've fortunately, that's one of the best compliments I've ever received. I was actually at, um, I was at Nick Diaz's uh, during COVID. I lived with him for about a month in Stockton. And, you know, when I was at his house, uh, he had a pe- some people over that just, you know, unfortunately never made it out of Stockton, California. You know, they just, uh, they just got caught up in some stuff, never made it out, you know, and one guy looked at me and he goes, he goes, you got a very, and he's like a hood ass dude. So him saying this was even cooler. Cause he's told me this. He said, uh, he said, you got a, you got a beautiful soul. And I was like, what do you mean? And he goes, he goes, you got a lot of life in you. And it's rare to see that around here. You got a lot of life and you, you give off a lot of life. And when he said that, you know, someone can call you good looking. Someone can call you, you know, uh, uh, cool. And like all these regular, when he said that, that stuck with me, you know, for a long time. And, and that was a very, so I, I think that's kind of what I would want to be remembered for, you know, having that kind of, uh, of energy, uh, giving off uh, human uh, spirit, human uh, spirit is probably the word I'm looking for human spirit. You have that positive energy. That's a hundred percent. I mean, you've always right. had, even probably when you have right. knocked over Zeb's coffee. You're I was just going to say that. Right? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Jared, we want him to talk about, you know, what can kids expect if they go to the barbarian center for you and Dylan Palacio talk about what, what Josh Sasfi and the barbarian center, what kids should expect if they come and just watch your you clinic. Have to also, man. Both. Yeah. So both I'll be, I'll be, t- we taking over Ohio, baby. We're going <laughs> South and Cincy and we're going Sandusky. We're going up on the lake, but, um, what you're going to expect is with me, you will get uh, some, some, some technique, you know, in, in very, what I like to think, you know, um, not unusual. I don't want to say that because that, that's, you know, a, a poor choice of words, but uh, stuff that you don't normally learn at a clinic. It's not the polished, it's not the polished high crotch single leg but it's positions that we're all in every day and it's not unique to one style. You know what I mean? So, so you will receive stuff like that. Um, another thing. So two things I hate that happen at clinics. First one, kids will come in. They'll say, you know, let's say Jordan Burroughs is showing a double leg, right? A kid will say, Oh, I already know this move. And it's like, that is one of the worst things you could do as a kid because I don't care if it's something that is your best move. If it's a high crotch and you've already learned a high crotch, right? There is little idiosyncrasy things that someone does that maybe you can make it better. Maybe, you know what I mean? Just little things. So that's the first one I hate. The second one I hate is let's say I'm uh, showing legs and someone is not a leg rider and they don't say, they don't say, Oh, I already know this. Instead they say, Oh, that's not my style. And they tune me out. That's another pet peeve of mine. You don't have to have my style. You don't have to be a leg rider to chop that up and put that leg riding into your bar series. There is ways to chop things up and dissect it and put it in there. So, so you're going to get a lot of that, a lot of, you know, small little parts of, of positions and situations, but also we're going to have a lot of fun. You know what I mean? If, if there's, if, if learning moves is the thing I want kids to, to get the most out of, it's fourth most important on my list. And that's on, number one is having fun. Number two is, can I relate and, and, and hang with the kids? You know, number three is, is uh, can I hold their attention? You know what I mean? And if all three of those happen, guess what? They'll probably learn some moves. So it's fourth most important, even though it's the thing that we want the most out of the camp. So they, you'll get that with me. But on top of that, um, we're going to work. You know, we'll have fun. We'll play games. We'll laugh. We'll tell stories, but towards the end, there'll be a good hour where I'll, I'll let you know what, what a college wrestling practice feels like. You know, you'll, you'll feel what that feels like. So, so the games will stop for about 60 minutes and, and, and we'll get after it too. So, so that, that that's kind of what I'm going to bring to Cincy and Sandusky next month. Can't wait. I can't wait, man. Can I get the, can I get your favorite 
adrenaline junkie dopamine favorite junk. Bur- favorite Burnett quote favorite Bernie quote yeah go go the Bernie quote and then I want to hear your best want to hear your best Dude, oh, oh my gosh <laughs> Dude, I got so many Bernie quotes um dude oh my gosh what does he say he he just starts talking funny uh one time he oh gosh i can't even say it on this podcast but you know you know the t-rex the t-rex what's yeah, it called yeah 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 yeah. you know yeah, the yeah. first word yeah <laughs> that's my favorite one we can't say that on air I but know. that's my first one i know what uh, you're talking. but okay favorite adrenaline junkie quote is that what you said no, no just like adventure even adventure dude the next one. <laughs> I don't know. Running with the balls. Running with the balls. Swimming, was swimming great. with the uh, with the sharks. Swimming with sharks is great. You know what we did? This was cool. This was like a like I romanticized this day so much in my head because it was so unbelievable. There's a place in, near Fiji called Palau. It's like Micronesia area. Yeah, I know where it is. About a million years ago. Not a million, but like 20,000 years ago, the water level was a lot higher on Earth. And over time, it came down. And there's these rocks, Rock Island, Palau. It trapped like a saltwater lake. Uh, did I lose you? Okay. Like a saltwater lake uh, in these rocks because the ocean level is below the rocks now. There's no like direct access from the ocean inside these rocks. So it's just a saltwater lake. About 10 million, that number is accurate, 10 million jellyfish got trapped in that lake. And because of de-evolution over time, they lost their sting. There's no predators in that lake. So there's no reason for them to have to have a sting. Wow. I right? saw you, you. I saw you swam with that. Right. Uh, you cheated. I thought cheated you were it. stinging you. Yeah. But listen, when you get in that lake, right, at first, you know that they're not going to sting you. But you know it's like it's it's crazy like you just don't and then you get comfortable they're touching your face and it's kind of like swimming in a dream because it's like a bunch of little heartbeats but millions of them i mean you can't go like this without hitting 10 it's unbelievable that was that was that was like swimming in a dream bro that was a beauty thing when you talk about that's a beauty thing compared to scare me didn't scare me it was like i'm on another i'm on I'm aliens right now this is yeah. unreal my body's was, gonna splatter if i hit the pavement here that's it's yeah. the opposite it's just like you're you're there it's like you and bryce are bushwhacking and there's this mountain in front of you and you're like right. oh my god look at this valley i'm in right now right exactly you appreciate it it's you I appreciate yeah, that's, it. that's one i was i was very grateful for that. that that was that was an important one um i probably should have thought about the word no tomorrow a little more because <laughs> There might be no tomorrow if I if I splat like you just I gotta I gotta, I gotta rethink that one. I'm just saying. I'm just listen. I'm being real here. I've only ever he been said, real with you. You got to know that. He said no tomorrow. Literally. <laughs> listen, I'm trying to keep it real with you. You like that? Hey, speaking of which, I'm gonna try it. Like I'm, I have somebody. I got I got a co-host with me right. Do you want to be in here or not? Oh, what's up? I somebody snuck in. Come on, it's let's Tom see him. Referred. They just want to see you real quick, Thomas. They just want to yeah. See they want to see. They want to wait. Hey Tommy, what's up, dude? Tommy, what's Tommy up, dude? In. What's Tommy, up, dude? One day in about in about fourteen years. Wait. Hey. Oh, can he's you hear locking. Me? He's locking. Say hi to him. What's up? Say hi. In fourteen years, we're going skydiving. No, you're not. <laughs> He'll still be seventeen. <laughs> oh man. In 14, uh, 15 years. Yeah. Um, the crazy thing is, you know, when you look at all the stuff you've done, what's the highest cliff you ever jumped off of into water? Like no parachute. Yeah. Yeah. Into water. Not that high. 60, 70 feet. Yeah. I've done it. I did a 65 foot. Did you do cocoa head? In uh, is that in Hawaii? Yeah. I did Hercules rock at Waimea, but I didn't do cocoa head. Yeah. Cocoa head. I wanted to do a real high one up Hawaii. at cocoa. I got to say it again. There's one called Shipwreck Point on Kauai. I want to do that one. That's like a 50, 60 footer. It's beautiful. Yeah, I did a couple. I did a 60, 70 footer off a of Cocoa Head that was really cool. And then that hurts, man. Yeah, North I'm not Shore. I'm scared of death on those. I'm scared of the sting. I took Schlater. There's a video of me taking Schlater and I think it was Nick, Dustin. 
Nick Dardanes, and then it was Dustin. Dustin, Nick Dardanes, and the one dude, the guy that went to Buck now. He's like the 165. Oh, this pump. was for the Hawaiian duels. Yeah. God, what's the Buck now guy's name? He was tough. He was an All American. And then he coached at oh. Minnesota. Kevin Lavalley. Lavalley was with us. He would not do it. Dardanes did it. Schlater did it. I did it for them. I modeled the behavior for them. And it was actually Spitting Cave where we did it. And then, all right, so I, I, that's right. That was that, that was that, uh, the, 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 the crack neck beach. What's it called? Sandy's Beach. Is that it? Sandy's? I'm not sure. You just made me think of something. I got one more we story. did one on the North off. Shore, too. I did one on the North Shore that my wife filmed that was like a 45 footer. And I landed on a coral, on a reef. That's why I'm here, isn't it? Dude, it was wild. It was like I, I hit it hard with my foot. You made me think. You made me think of one more because you said cliff jumping, and one more story for you. This is a good one. So, me and Anthony DiCarlo, who was also part of No Tomorrow, he wrestled at Ohio State. He's the guy on the hot air balloon jump. That is that he from me. Springfield? Yes. yes. I met him at Iron Sharpens Iron. I like him. Yes, yes, you did. Yes, he's, yes. he's still in Columbus, right? Or is he now? Mm-hmm. Yep, down in he Columbus. Up in out or what? He doesn't have a job right now. He actually just uh, no tomorrow. He just no tomorrow. Oh, Yellow, <laughs> no no, <laughs> no tomo. <laughs> That's right, baby. So um, so we decided this is actually before the Palau trip. We flew to the Philippines. Now it was my birthday. It was July fifth, and uh, we had our flight from the Philippines from Cebu to Palau at like eight p.m. that night. And it's like 3 a.m. at this point. So we have what? I can't do the math. Uh, 20, 20, 20 hours. You know what I mean? Whatever it is. No, not even. I'm so stupid. Like 15, 18 hours, right? I don't know. Whatever it is. We have like 18 hours till we have to be there at the airport. We schedule swimming with whale sharks and canyoning, which is a package deal. Dude, we schedule swimming with whales. the coolest things I've ever done. Right. Canyon is I did it in Switzerland. It's amazing. Yeah, you probably went to interlocking. I went to interlocking. Yeah, right. It was amazing. It's like the canyoning capital, right? For those yes. who don't know, canyoning is like guided natural water slides and guided cliff jumping. And the the coolest part, in my opinion, is the rappelling. The rappelling. Yeah, you is repel. Cool. You belay. You rappel down. Yeah. yeah. But it's down. I mean, these like narrow canyons Dude. that glacier waters carving through. It's, it's one of the coolest like, things I've ever done. Yeah. And, Did you and do I mean, an interlocking? Did you do it? No, I did it, I've done it in, I've never been to Switzerland, but I did it in France, Italy, and then Philippines. I can't. Dude, the interlocking one I did was, it's amazing. It was Sick. I mean, it looks like, it looks like that's where they get cool blue Gatorade from. Like it is just blue yes. water. Yes. You know? yes. And, and the year before, uh, there was 15 Australians on the same exact river. A flash flood came and oh, walked God. them down the river and killed them all. Jeez. Yeah. Can't, I mean, it's no joke. You're in the, yeah. you're in the, you're in, Narrow. you're in God's playground. You're, you're in the mother mountain. nature's playground. It is, it is no joke. It's mother nature's amusement park. But, um, okay. So it's ironic. You said 15 Australians. So check this. We have a driver bring us from Cebu to the whale sharks. And then about an hour past the whale sharks, we go canyoning. So we finished the whale sharks around 8 AM. We drive to canyoning and we're like four or five hours away from the Cebu airport that we have to be at at 8 p.m. So, you know, it's, let's say 10 a.m. at this point, we're about to start canyoning. And there's 15, not Australians, but Koreans and not South Koreans. I didn't know North Koreans could leave to go on vacation. That's really ignorant of me. I don't know. But it was a group of 15 North Korean people that were going to be a part of our canyoneering uh, group. All right. And there's, um, there's like four or five, guides that are taking down everybody so we look at this guy that's like our age and we're like yo we have a flight at 8 p.m if we're gonna do this with this whole group it's gonna take us five six hours like can we like hustle through with you and he looks at us and he goes dude i got you he's for he's filipino he's like we're gonna do the gnarliest stuff and we're just gonna go down this entire canyon we're gonna repel we're gonna do it all and we're just gonna go on our own so me and Anthony were stoked. We're like, yes, let's do it. And we start. And again, cotton candy, blue water, uh, a little different than Switzerland and France is 
it was kind of a jungle look aesthetically because of the Filipino, like tropical, Southeast right? Asia. Exactly. You're on the so it was very, it was very tropical looking plus the canyoning, you know, we're, you know, rope swinging into the Canyon where natural water slides, everything we're doing it all. There was uh, this one guy from North Korea that decided he was going to keep up with me and Anthony and the two tour guides that took us. So it was two tour guides, me and Anthony, North Korean. Now, I don't want to sound ignorant, but this North Korean guy had a very stereotypical, you know, Korean look. He was very stone faced the entire time. You know what I mean? When I'm jumping off of something, my face is like fear, fun. It's all over the place, right? This guy was like, boom, stone face, jump, stone face, jump, right? And on top of that, these Filipino people, these guides, kept telling us Filipino cuss words to say, right? And I don't know what they mean. They could have, it could have been out. I'm a little fair. I have no idea what I was saying, but they were like, hey, say, say, halana. So I'd be at the top of this cliff with a bunch of Filipino people at the bottom. Halana. And I would jump off and everybody's laughing at me. I had no idea what I was saying. So this guy looks at me and uh, this, this guide, and he goes, you want to know how to speak some Korean? And I was like, sure. He goes, don't be a wussy, but not wussy. The other word with a P don't be a wussy in Korean. And I hope I'm not butchering this is Joel Chima. So at the top of every single water slide, I would Joel Chima sliding down, right? Laughing. And this North Korean dude was like stone face. So I'm thinking like, dude, like he hates us. Like, this is not okay. We are disrespecting his culture. This is not okay. Joel Chima jump, Joel Chima jump. All of a sudden, we get to a 60-foot cliff over a waterfall. This thing is called Kawasan Falls. If you look it up, look it up, Zeth. It starts with a K, Kawasan Falls. Unreal. Beautiful. Now, the thing about this waterfall was when you cliff jump off of it, you have to kind of like lean out to this tree branch that is hanging off the side. You have to lean to that and then push off to clear the ledge so you don't smoke yourself because that'd be a that'd be a bad day. That wouldn't be a fun day, right? So I'm a little spooked, right? I jump, Jolchi Ma lands. Anthony jumps, Jolchi Ma lands. This Korean dude leans off, grabs a tree branch, and he's sitting there and he's shaking. Now we're at the bottom in the water. Jolchi Ma, you got this, you got this, right? And I swear, I can, I don't know if you know where this is going, but it was like out of a movie. This dude jumps midair, 60 feet, like slow-mo, points at us, screams, Jolchi Ma, as he lands, dude, we were, <laughs> sell oh. Oh, it was like awesome. we won the Olympics, we were celebrating, going did crazy, he, did he pop that up, was one of not stone face, was he laughing, smiling, pop? laughing, hugging us, he was hugging us, I think, I don't think it was the president that ended the Korean War, I think that day did it, I think we did it, <laughs> we freak, it was unbelievable, I'm telling you. Gochima. Gochima. It could have been, I'm a little girl. I have no idea what I was saying, but that was, it was awesome. Oh, that's awesome. I love it. That is good stuff, man. I love it. <laughs> the next one, huh? The next one, baby. What's the next one? Egypt. When? End of the month. I think I'm going to try and go to Egypt at the end of the month. Can you do it? 96 it's hour cold. test. You're allowed to do it. 96 hour P, uh, COVID test. Oh, that's before, it. Before the flight. No quarantine as of right now. Yes. Go. Let's go. No tomorrow. No tomorrow, baby. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. You got anything else for him, Jared? Oh, uh, fun times, Johnny. I appreciate you that. guys having me. Thank you so much. Thank and you. then hopefully Dude. everybody listening, I'll see you at the camp. We got to get you some Ohio swag. We got to get you some Barbarian. Barbarian, I'll trade swag. you. I'll trade you some no tomorrow stuff. So, yeah, Jared, uh, real quick, great. how can people hit up a Barbarian Apparel? Yep, and Bar use our code barbarianapparel.com slash ba hour. He's got some sweet singlet deals going on right now. Got uh, this sick got, shirt got, you yep. can buy. Yep, that's some I sick, like it. sick for deals, the podcast. Yeah. The Barbarian Hour, Johnny DeJulius, Thanks, our guest. Johnny. Thank you for coming on, man. We appreciate you. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Hello wrestlers and coaches, I'm Teague Moore. I spent 20 years coaching at the Division I level in the NCAA. 
15 of those years as a head coach. During that time, I helped a lot of wrestlers and parents navigate the recruiting process. I've now opened my own consulting business to do just that, to help you navigate the recruiting process. There's a lot of unanswered questions. How do scholarships work? What program would be right for my son? Or better yet, what coach would be right for my wrestler? I can help answer these and many other questions. Feel free to email me or call me at the information listed below and we can set up your first consultation today. I look forward to working with you and helping you make the right choice.